So I, when I was a kid, uh, I learned this song, and I bet you know it too. So if you do, sing along, because I know you hadn't had enough music yet. So um, let's see here. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Yeah, y'all did pretty good with that. So some of you know that song. It is a children's song, and it all has to rhyme. And they did leave out some colors, you know, olive and brown and those kind of things. But the point of the song was to teach us that God's love is universal, that it's everywhere. And, uh, and it's a children's song, so it's about children. But Revelation chapter 7 kind of gives us the bigger picture where John is taken up into heaven and part of what he sees is when he turns around, he sees before the throne of God this multitude of people of, let's see here, of every nation and every tribe and every people and every language. And that's John's way of saying everybody's there. You know, everybody. And they're all wearing white robes, which means these are the folks that have been purified by Jesus Christ. And they all have a palm branch in their hand, and they all are praising God about the salvation of God that comes from God and from the Lamb, which is Jesus Christ. And that scene is telling us that this Lamb of God, Jesus, is seen as a lamb because he's the sacrificial lamb and his death is what washed away our sins so that we could wear the white robe and be purified. You know, all through the scriptures you see this, that God's love goes beyond, not beyond you know, it's not just for a group of people. It goes out. It goes out to every tribe and every nation. I love that... Uh, that vision that Peter had where he's getting ready to go see a man named Cornelius, and Cornelius is not like him. So this is going to take him out of his comfort zone. In fact, he would probably object to the whole idea, except he keeps seeing this vision three times where the sheet comes down, and you remember the vision. And the point of that was when God makes something clean, it's clean. And God will work anywhere he wants to work and with whoever he wants to work with. And so God's love is universal, and so our love should be universal as well. You know, we need to love people. In fact, we need to love everybody because our God loves everybody. But not everybody's kind of caught this. George Wallace is a great uh, example of somebody that didn't catch this. In fact, in 1962, he ran for governor of Alabama, and man, his uh, rhetoric was so bigotry and such prejudice, it was appalling to a lot of people. He uh, personally blockaded a school's door. His uh, speech would end with segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. And then he was able to run for president in 1968, spouting his racial hatred the whole time while blacks were being beaten, while blacks were being jailed, and even black children were being murdered. I'm old enough, because I'm an old guy, to remember uh, life a little bit before civil rights. Now, granted, I will tell you that a lot of that era is kind of fuzzing out on me now, just because it was a while back. But I remember my brother getting in trouble because he drank from the wrong water fountain. We were at an ice cream store there to have ice cream. And there were two water fountains in the back of the store. And he drank from the wrong one. And man, he got a lecture about that. I remember that just barely. My brother, who I talked to this week, he remembers it very vividly. But that was the kind of thing that was going on back then. My first pastor, first time I pastored a church, I got in trouble pretty quick. Because I remember we were going through the, through the Bible, and we got to Exodus uh, pretty quickly. And, um, and when we got to Exodus, I was talking about Moses and uh, how he had married an Ethiopian woman. And I pointed out that everybody I knew from Ethiopia was black. And man, I got a little pushback on that. 
It was kind of polite at first, and, but I got to watch over the next five years as we talked about the Ethiopian eunuch, as we talked about Moses' marriage and how Miriam and, and uh, Aaron reacted to that in Numbers chapter 12, how we uh, began to, to look at Jonah. Uh, and Jonah is not a story about, I mean, the key point is not about people can get swallowed by whales. You have to go to North Carolina and deal with the sharks to deal with that. But that story is really about prejudice and Jonah's prejudice against people that weren't like him. But I remember watching that congregation as their attitudes changed, as they really began to look at the Scripture and what it says about God's love and his view of people. More recently, I'm the field strategist for Virginia Baptist, and, and my region is the northern region, which is not Richmond or Charlottesville, but it's everything in between to the top of the state. And one of the things I notice when I go, like any church above Woodbridge, as I go up the 95 quarter, if they're not racially mixed and ethnically mixed, that's a first sign to me that that's an unhealthy church. And I can see that just in the seven years that I've been doing that, rolling further and further away from Washington, D.C. Now, it is true that the economic level there is not as different. And so bridging those gaps is a lot easier than when you have uh, economic imbalance as well as a racial imbalance. But it's pretty exciting watching this. But you know, history, the history books, they kind of miss out as they're trying to explain these things because they, they, they sort of paint a picture that this progression is very orderly in kind of a straight line when that's not the case at all. In fact, when it comes to that kind of progression, there are fits and starts, there is moving forward, there is moving backwards. And whenever a change happens, it happens on a macro level. You know, when the politicians make this declaration or a big law is passed, but it also, even more importantly, happens on a macro level. Let's see, that's the macro, the big stuff, and then the micro level as well, where people in their personal relationships begin to change. And that's where the real change takes place. Now, whenever there's racial progress, it's always met with resistance. Some of times the, the resistance is passive. Sometimes it's, uh, it's active. Sometimes it's violent. And lately in our country... We've seen the violence. We've seen the pushback in some horrific ways. And I don't know about you, but it's kind of re-energized into me, this, uh, this burden. And my question, and my, my, my guess is for a lot of you too, the question is, well, what can I do about it? What can I do to help the situation instead of hurt the situation? What words that can I say that are going to help, and what words can I say, that are going to not help? How can I move this thing in the direction it needs to move? And how can I be a part of that? Well, I've really wrestled with that lately. I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of people about it. And frankly, I've kind of come to the conclusion that for me, the answer is, is to follow Jesus into Samaria. Follow Jesus into Samaria. Now that kind of bounces off of John chapter 4, the woman at the well story. But where Jesus goes into Samaria, and Samaria in that day was the no-no place. It was the place where Jews just didn't want to go. In fact, there was a hatred for the Samaritans. They were people to be avoided. At one point, when they are in Samaria... Uh, uh, there's a town that sort of resists Jesus and immediately his disciple says hey let's call down fire on that bunch you know Jesus at one point the 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 religious leaders they said see you we were right when we called you a Samaritan a Samaritan was not a good name to give someone but here in John chapter 4 we see Jesus go into Samaria. In fact, I love the wording. It says, and he had to go into Samaria. You know, he had the choice, like every other Jew, to just kind of go around it. 
But very quickly, you, can, you, know, you can take that phrase two ways. Maybe he didn't have the time to go around, but we know just because of who Jesus was that he had to go to Samaria because he had to go into a place where people were different than him. And so he went. And he went. And I think our call in this passage is to follow Jesus into Samaria. And following Jesus into Samaria means some things. The first thing it means is that we are going to go outside of our comfort zone. Our comfort zone. In fact, the Great Commission, when Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel, you know, he says it like this, go into Jerusalem and Samaria and Judea and to the uttermost parts of the world. Well, the Samaria there is when he's saying, go into the places that are outside of your comfort zone. And actually, Samaria isn't far away in the Bible. It's right next door. But still, it's out of their comfort zone. And so that command is telling us to go and, well, to go to the people in the shadows, the people on the fringes, the people that are marginalized. But it's also saying, go to people that aren't like you. Go to people that are different than you are. You know, the Bible doesn't talk about tolerance. We hear a lot of talk today about tolerance, that we need to tolerate tolerate this and tolerate that and we must be we must be people of tolerance but the bible never talks about tolerance the bible said instead commands us to love which is way past tolerance i mean the whole thing of tolerance is sort of saying we disagree we're not like we uh, it, it all kind of focuses on the differences and that we just sort of need to coexist but the Bible doesn't say anything about that. Instead, the Bible says we are to love. And love goes so far past being tolerant. In fact, love is more than passing laws and taking flags down and, and doing all of these outward symbols, although that, that helps. But you see, love moves past that to relationship. And so the Bible is calling us into having relationships with people outside of our comfort zone. When it comes to following Jesus into Samaria, I think it also means that we need to draw bigger circles. Somebody pointed out to me recently, I didn't see this, but they had gone to a contest where you draw, uh, the, the object of the contest is to draw a perfect circle. Have you ever tried that? I don't know about you, but I can't even draw a straight line, you know, freehand. But to draw a circle, perfect circle, that's really hard to do. But you know who the winners were? They weren't the people that drew it little. It was the people that drew it big. They'd put a big piece of paper on the wall, and they'd take their marker, and they'd swing their arm, and they'd go... Whoosh! And those circles were a lot more perfect than the people that tried to make them smaller. Now, why is that? Well, I don't know. I've tried it, and frankly, my arm doesn't do that number as well. But I will tell you this. We need to draw bigger circles in our life. I mean, take your social circle and enlarge it. Examine the relationships that you have, and then push outside those boundaries. Draw your circles bigger. Build some relationship with people by talking with them, by building that relationship, that building that relation to the place of trust so that you can have some of those hard conversations. Where you can talk about the positives about the differences and you can talk about the heritage that is involved and the cultures that are involved and, and, and learn from that. But also you need to have those conversations about things that are hard, like the prejudice they have experienced and what is hard about being of a different race than what you are but to have those conversations I think will take us to a new level but it's going to be us going one by one and building those relationships in uh, Germany well you know there used to be the, the Iron Curtain and the Iron Curtain wasn't iron in the cities it was stone but outside the cities, in the country part, it was wire. It was a wire fence. It was tall. 
It had wire at the top to keep people in and to keep people out. And what happened over the decades is that, well, it also kept animals out. And people that study the red deer, you know, deer, not white-tailed deer, but something like that. I guess they just didn't have the white, the white tails. But they, they studied these, these animals. And, and what's interesting is since the wall came down, the animals still don't cross that line. That's pretty amazing. I mean, they run in herds, and the herds will run past the line, but then they head right back right again. And the individuals never go past the line. And I mean, they've got GPS trackers on these deer now and all of that. And, and one particular deer that they studied, I would pronounce its name, but I don't, can't pronounce it. It's A-H, a uh, uh, horn, uh, see, I shouldn't have tried that. But anyway, but this one particular deer, it, it comes right up to that line and then turns and goes the other way. Now, what's amazing about that? is that deer was born 18 years after the wall came down. 18 years. And another thing's amazing about it is the area where that one lives, the area where the wall was, has been turned into a nature preserve. And so it would be a great place to hang out. But that deer will come right up to where, you know, and then head right on back out again. And what the biologists say, they say the wall is still in their head. And the way that we're going to be able to break down that wall in our head, even though we may not have been born with it, it's still there, is to go beyond that wall and get out of our comfort zone and draw our circles bigger. Also, to follow Jesus into Samaria, I have to tell you that sometimes when you go and you venture beyond the beaten path, well, you're going to have to do that alone. A lot of times there'll be pushback. There'll be pushback from the group that you're leaving to venture outside of your zones. And there might also be pushback from the people that you're reaching out to. In fact, that's amazing to me, but that's what happens. Often you end up doing this by yourself. You know, I love it when churches, uh, and, and churches I've been involved in have, have done this for, you know, as long as I can remember, where we would break down some of these uh, racial barriers by doing joint events and those kind of things. But that's a little easier than doing the one-on-one -on -one thing. The one-on-one -on -one thing is a lot more challenging. It's a lot more personal. I mean, when we trade choirs and trade speakers or we have events together, that's a little easier. But when we go out one-on-one -on -one and we reach across and we build relationships with people, sometimes that is hard. And oftentimes you'll find yourself doing that by yourself. You know, Jesus must have done this thing with uh, where he kind of went into Samaria and and then he got with this woman there, and he had this conversation all by herself. And, and folks today would say, that, that just doesn't look right. But Jesus must have done that a lot. Because he was accused often of being a friend of tax collectors, that's pretty low, and prostitutes and sinners. He must have done that a lot, where he went out of the comfort zone. But often you end up doing that by yourself because really prejudice works both directions. There's another song that we used to sing. You might remember it too. It was, um, I have decided to follow Jesus. Remember that song? Remember that verse? And this is the verse that haunts me. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow, though none go with me, I still will follow, no turning back, no turning back. Now I started this message by telling you about George Wallace and kind of setting him up as an example of bigotry, but I really didn't tell you the rest of the story. Because all of that happened in the 60s, but in 1972, he was shot five times. And that, 
um, shooting. Uh, well, he was never able to walk again, never able to uh, control his bodily functions. Uh, he uh, was in constant pain for the rest of his life. Nine years after that shooting, he had his driver, because he was too handicapped to drive, drive him one Sunday morning to Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. It's where Martin Luther King Jr. had been the pastor a long time ago. And he had Archie, his driver, help him into his wheelchair, and Archie rolled him into the church and rolled him up the aisle, and they let him speak. It was unplanned. It shocked everybody when he came through the door. (laughs) And basically what he said to the people there, he said, I had no connection with suffering and pain until I was shot seven years ago. But now I know what that's about. And I think I have a taste of what African Americans have suffered in this country. And then he confessed that he knew that he was a part of a lot of that pain. And then he asked the people, the African Americans of Alabama, to forgive him. It wasn't a one-time thing. From there on out, for the rest of his life, he did whatever he could to correct the wrongs that he had done. He got with every African-American leader that would meet with him, and he basically confessed and repented over and over again. He got before groups when they would allow him. Uh, He was able to use his position. He uh, appointed over 360 African-Americans to significant positions in Alabama. Even after he was out of office, He continued to meet at prayer meetings uh, that were basically made up of blacks and other prayer meetings that were basically made up of whites. Even when he couldn't leave his home anymore and he was dying, some of the friendships that he had built where he had gone into Samaria came and visited him right up until the end. He kept those relationships. Now, not everybody accepted his repentance. Not everybody thought that he had done, you know, what he said he had done, that he'd had that change of heart. Because he had caused, I mean, a lot of pain, a lot of grief, a lot of suffering. But you know, I think, even though I never met the man, I think he was a changed person. And the reason I believe that is because in my years of ministry, I have seen Jesus Christ change people from the inside out. I've seen him take deep-rooted feelings and unroot them. I've seen him take old creatures and turn them into new. In fact, I've seen him do that in me. And so I believe that Jesus Christ can change us. That He can move us to the kind of people that we're supposed to be. I also believe with all my heart, if we'll follow Him into Samaria, if we'll move out of our comfort zone, if we'll make relationships and try to build relationships with people that aren't like us, that He will honor that. That He will come and He will empower you. And He will give you a supernatural love. And the relationships that are developed will be amazing. And you see, I think we can change the laws. I think I can get up here and preach a lot. But I think what's really going to change our country and move it to the place where it needs to be is for us to move out of our circles and make our circles larger, and to follow Jesus into Samaria. Well, Father, I hope I didn't put my foot in my mouth too bad there. Because what we're talking about is a very hot, hot, hot topic. 
And it's hard to navigate those waters. And Lord, you know how I've prayed that I wouldn't do any harm here today, but I would just do good. But God, I ask that you take the words and that you remake them so that the hearer hears your message. And also, Lord, I pray that every person in this room will be challenged to move out of their comfort zone, to draw their circles larger, and to follow you into Samaria, even if it means going by ourselves. Father, we want to be followers of you, and you had to go into Samaria. Thank you, Lord. Amen.